Uncle George, and Susanna asked me to MC this little story and song swap, and I'm gonna start and say some things I wanna say and sing a couple of songs and then get out of the way and hope you guys are thinking about what you wanna say and sing and share. How's everybody doing? It's quiet, it's late. <laughs> yeah. So there were so many words said about Uncle George today and the couple that are in my notes are, are wisdom and joy. And I just have a few things, memorable things from my experiences with him. He said so many wise, encouraging things in his life. And one of the earliest ones for me is, I think I was a teenager or 20 something and he said that uh, the history of the organized church had been written. And the follow-up was, well, the history of the influence of Swedenborg not in the organized church hadn't been written, and it was bigger. And I, I was held on to that little phrase, the history of the organized church, that's been written, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then in a, in a previous um, fracas that my poor family caused, Uncle George said, that healing comes from the edges and, and that the primary combatants who we all know weren't gonna lay down their arms and hug each other but maybe the wife of one of them and the nephew of another one were gonna talk a little and, and they're gradually be healing and I, I've held on to that phrase too that healing, healing might come from the edges. And then my uncle who I don't think knew anything about dumb questions I don't know where, if he originated this, but he, he said this many times that if, if you wanted to ask a dumb question, just add the word precisely or exactly. <laughs> like, like, precisely what is for dinner? Or precisely what does that sign mean? And, and then you would sound smarter. I, I, um, and I remember early, you know, long before Zoom, when Uncle George started teaching online for SSR or PSR, that he, I, I, he got amusement out of the delay where he would say something witty or funny and expect a reaction, but it would take a few seconds. And, and he just, uh, he, he communicated to me that that was just humorous to him. It reminded me that a, a bitter colleague of mine once told me I was easily amused. It was a slur. And I said, yeah, I love being easily amused. And I think <laughs> Uncle George was easily amused too. And maybe Sarah will tell us the cheese sandwich story later too, because that's an easily amused story too. And I bet there are a lot of people here experienced Uncle George similarly to me. That I, I just felt like I was special to him. And I felt like he wanted to, to share something with me. He cared about me and my family, he, you know, and Every time I saw him, there was that, you know, I, I don't think I was his favored nephew. I think he favored everybody. <laughs> um, and he had a way of, of, uh, of flipping thoughts, of like looking into a subject and finding a paradox, but finding peace with the paradox uh, that I just loved. That I, I, I rarely experienced someone like that who could delve so deeply into a subject, but turn it over, or turn it sort of upside down sometimes or sideways and come up with a conclusion that you wouldn't necessarily come up with. And when I first heard that he left us, this song came to my mind. I talked to Sarah about it online and shared the original. It's my favorite singer songwriter, Jesse Winchester, who has a connection to this part of the world, Vermont and, and Canada. And, and I think he has a similar talent of uh, taking a topic and sort of turning it around and this song sort of spoke to me that way. Let's see if I can pull it off this late at night. If you love somebody then that means you need somebody And if you need somebody That's what makes you weak But if you know you're weak And you know you need someone Oh, it's a funny thing That's what makes you strong That's what makes you strong 
That's what gives you power, that's what lets the meek come sit beside the king. That's what lets us smile in our final hour, that's what moves our souls, and that's what makes us sing. And to trust somebody is to be disappointed. It's never what you wanted. And it happens every time. But if you're the trusting kind, this don't even cross your mind. Oh, it's a funny thing. That's what makes you strong. That's what makes you strong. That's what gives you power. That's what lets the meek come sit beside the king. That's what lets us smile in our final hour. That's what moves our souls. And that's what makes us sing. That's what moves our souls. And that's what makes us sing. Fan club is here. So um, I'm going to sing one more. And I hear this was done recently by someone with my same last name. And I asked him to sing it with me. And I, I got a long, detailed explanation in, in Trevor M.I. language um, that I should do it myself. And so I am going <laughs> to. It was very persuasive. Um, precisely. And, precisely. <laughs> and, and, um, um, I'm not going to do tinkering with the toilets. I hope someone will. Uh, Uncle George had so much talent in so many ways. I mean, think of him sitting in this room whittling clever little things. Uh, and, and, yet, and, and he could play the guitar very well. And, and he could write so funny little songs. I mean, I don't know how many of you know tinkering with the toilets. You know, that he's, he, 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 he was a yeah, parody of Tiny Tim singing tiptoe through the tulips, which was tinkering with, which is what he did here. So, and then there's this one, which uh, um, uh, I loved Uncle George's tenor voice, and I have a bass voice, so we'll see <coughs> how this goes. I actually I'm not that good a guitarist to set this down. And there's one chord that I still, after, I've been playing this song for 40 years, yeah. and there's still one chord I have trouble getting into. I sat there and practiced. I actually put marking pen on my guitar, so we'll see if I can sort of wing it. Woke up this morning with the rising bell. Thought the sun was shining, but I really can't tell about the weather too well when my lids are frozen shut. I went up to the house to join the bunch. The fire was blazing, I was told, but that wall. Buddies don't know about their fronts, but their backsides sure were cold. They have those shaky, shivery, quaky, quivery, all over trembly new church assembly blues. Later on, it got about as hot as it could get. The sunshine sure felt nice. But I don't know yet if that wet was sweat. Cause it could have been melting ice. I went to the river to beat the heat. Plucked up my courage and a dough, but I stopped too sweet 
when the water hit my feet and made a beeline for the pot belly stove. I had those shaky, shivery, quaky, quivery, all over trembly new church assembly blue. <laughs> Cold settled in as the sun went down, bundled me into my bed with twelve gray blankets, thirteen brown, all pulled up over my head. But I still turned blue where the cold seeped through. Three mattresses were just a little thin. Even though I'm blue, I'll be seeing you when the rising bell rings again. I'll have those shaky, shivery, quaky, quivery, all over trembly new church assembly blues. audience we have out in <laughs> internet land. So come up and use the mic and share a story or a song. Or Here comes God. Yeah, I'm going to get up Come on, This is water. I'm going to get up early. It's been a long day, so I am probably not going to last very long, so I want to get my story in early, but not often. Okay, so I told a story last night about Anita Dole. I'm going to tell it again with a slight embellishment because I have a mirror image of the same story that is as true. That includes actually George. So some weren't here last night when we were asked to, we were asked to rem remember Anita Dole, right? We had a lovely slideshow. And I offered that as a 10-year-old boy, for those of you who heard this, I'm going to add one thing. I was about 10, and I know I was thinking, and it, because it must have been I heard it from my grandmother, Hazel Baker Clark, because she did tell me these things, that Swedenborg's writings were revelation from God and that they were true. Well, this sounded important to a 12-year-old, and uh, I, I was standing in front of the fireplace on a cold August morning during the camp session, looking at the flames licking on the log, and realized I was standing next to Anita Dole. I looked up to her, and saw the reflection of the fire and the flames in her glasses. <laughs> and, and as I look back on that, in my, adult, in my adult self, I think I might have been thinking I'm having a religious experience. <laughs> so I asked her, uh, I don't think I said Mrs. Dole, I, I said, um, are the writings revelation, and are they true? Now, and she, uh, I could see her face perfectly, just as I can now in my mind's eye. She was very elderly. She did not say a thing, and I thought she wasn't going to answer, but she did. She said, yes, they are revelation. And yes, I know they're true because I've applied them to my life. They work. All right. Okay, that's a lovely story. I would have, wouldn't have told that today because I told it yesterday or the day before at Anita's Remembrance. But 
I want to tell you a, a similar story that is as true with George Dole. I am now a theologue at the theological school. I'm in my uh, mid to late 20s. George is teaching a seminar of some sort at the Bridgewater Church with young people, and I'm tagging along. We are finding ourselves standing on a stoop that goes, that at the time went into the kitchen of the Bridgewater Church. George was smoking a pipe, which he did at the time. And <laughs> true to form, I'm a little more mature now, I looked at George and I said, George, uh, actually, I, I need to reframe this just a little bit. Um, I didn't frame the exact same question because during this conference, I had learned that there was a debate about the authority of the writings. On what basis uh, do you place authority on the writings? Is it because they are directly from God or is there a, another basis upon which you do this? This was a, a pretty big issue. Or was Swedenborg's uh, uh, life and work involved in this question? Okay, so I phrase, phrase the question. I'm standing there, I'm looking at him, I can see him clear as a bell. This is 1977, 78. He's smoking his pipe, he's leaning against the railing. He does not move, he does not answer the question. I am just about to leave and he starts speaking. He said, yes, uh, yes, they are revelation, yes, they are true. But as to this question of authority, I give authority to those teachings which I bring into my life and to which I, uh, and, and in accord to which I live. That is the basis of authority that I find their truth, quote unquote. Okay, I wanted to present that mirror image of George. Um, as a bonus, I, uh, I happen to know George's very first thought in his life. He happened to tell me that. Just, and, and I also know his favorite main story, which I am not going to tell. Aww. No, that will not happen. No, 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 I'm not even going to do that. But uh, anyway, if somebody wants to know his very first thought, can anybody else say it? I mean, he told me this. This was his first thought ever. Want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, George um, is in the parsonage. He's in the upstairs bedroom. Uh, you all know, uh, probably everybody knows that Louis Dole built the, much of that upstairs woodwork and put in a beautiful oak flooring. George can't walk yet. I, I, well, maybe he can walk. But he is working his way <laughs> across the sill of the what, 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 northwest facing window in that, which looks next door to what I happen to know as the Bovines home. Beautiful federal style uh, main home on Elm Street. And he's, he's able to support himself because he's working his way across the sill like this. He told me this story. This is true. And he, he spies the, the, the bovine's dog. <laughs> I can't believe this. He spies the dog sitting on his haunches like this. George is eyeball to eyeball with the dog. <laughs> the dog is a, it's a, a fair ways away. It's like 35 yards. He's looking at the dog, and here's his first thought. He looks at his hands. He says, here's my right hand. <laughs> here's my left hand. He looks at the dog. He says, that on the right is not the dog's right hand. That's the dog's left hand. <laughs> you know this is true, don't you? <laughs> he told me this. <laughs> OK. Um, that's the end of this show, by the way. <laughs>
my Uncle George loved his sister, my mother, so I just want to channel my mom here for a moment. Uh, in 1985, my mother wrote in her Reflections column, we remember George Dole's witticisms livening up the conversation. One of our favorites came at the end of the session. George sustained a slight wound while helping take down the tents. When asked how he got hurt, he replied, we struck the tents and one of them struck me. This is a secondhand story that I only learned last week, and I learned it from another minister not present uh, who swore me to secrecy. I insisted that I had to tell the story because I knew tonight was coming. Um, and I did get permission to tell the story, but not to reveal the minister who told me the story. So back in the 70s, um, the flames were getting a bit profane publicly. And it had kind of become a problem that needed to be dealt with by camp leadership. And so it was decided that the flames were going to all get corralled and get, and get spoken to about the need to dial it back a bit. And so um, I guess at the end of a meal, um, it, uh, it was announced that the flames needed to go to Chalmers Lodge and um, and uh, for a bit of a conversation. And so uh, the flames did go to Chalmers Lodge, followed by two ministers, one of whom was George. And um, he did give them a rather stern talking to about the need to clean up their language a bit and so forth. And on the way out the door with the other mis minister, as they were just out of earshot, George turned to the other minister and said, one of the best damn lectures I ever gave. <laughs> I started coming to camp in 1989, and in 1999 I was ordained, 10 years later, coming to camp all that time. And then once I was ordained the year after that, I took over doing the um, lecture program organizing in 2000. So I've been doing that 21 years. So about 11 years ago, when I'd been doing it for 10 years, and I'd been at camp for 10 years, and this was the funny thing, today in the service when it was talked about that George lost his main accent purposely. But when he spoke this to me, and it was not in a main accent, but it was such the manner in him that I could hear it in a main accent. And he said, well, guess you're all going to stay around. <laughs> so that was when he decided he could pass on helping me do the lecture program. And he passed it on. And it's carried on ever since. But a true mena you are not going to be around unless you're around at least 20 years, and then we'll trust you. Um, this is just a few, month, a few months ago. Um, Dad, Dad broke his arm. He, he took a fall and he broke his, his right arm, and so he wasn't able to um, type. Um, but he, um, he started to figure out uh, voice recognition on his, on his computer. He started to figure out the voice dictation. And, you know, Dad didn't text or anything. He didn't do any any of those things. So this was his first experience with 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 uh, your voice to text, and um, he found it hilarious. All the silly things. I mean, I wish Alicia told me some of the funny like permutations that the computer came up with for Swedenborg. <laughs> but 
his his favorite thing was he was he was uh, busy writing a footnote, and my mom came in to ask him what he wanted for lunch, um, and uh, when he turned back to the footnote, it's you know. It's it's uh, it's there in the footnote. George, do you want a cheese sandwich? <laughs> and he just thought that was the funniest thing. <laughs> and Ian wishes that was still in the footnote, and so do I. Hi everybody, I'm a genuine senior citizen here at Freiburg. Been coming here for a long time and I learned at this camp how to speak with a Maine accent. So there's this uh, gentleman who's from out of town and he's lost and he's driving around somewhere on the coast out here and he stops a Maine gentleman and he says, sir, can you tell me how to get to Millinocket? And the Mainer goes, well, you could take Route 302 North. Nope, that ain't going to do it. You could take uh, 16 West after you do that. Nope, that ain't going to do it. Uh, you could take Route 15 uh, between the two of them. Nope, sir, that ain't going to do it. You can't get to Millinocket from here. And then there's another one about a Texan who comes to a Maine farm. He says, so tell me, friend, how much land you got here? And the Maine guy says, I got a couple hundred acres here. He said, ha, huh, yeah. He said, if you come down to Texas, I'll show you around my place. Now, if we set off w driving west, um, we go for about um, two or three hours, and then we head north, and we go for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I shifted to a main accent. <laughs> <laughs> then we go north, and we, we drive another couple of hours, and then we go east and drive another couple of hours, and then we go south, and after that amount of time, we come to where we started. And the main guy looks at him and he says, I had a car like that one time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so George and I used to, um, uh, uh, we were on the board of directors of the foundation for about um, maybe 18 years or so together and we always used to uh, sort of store up jokes. And uh, I, I was no less guilty of this than he was, I think. I, uh, he, he just kind of knew them. Uh, I, I had to store them up. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, um, the first one is this um, horse walks into a bar, and the bartender looks over at him and says, why a long face? <laughs> and then there's the one about the panda that walks into an upscale restaurant and he orders the most expensive salad on the menu. Oh, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a panda wearing a six gun. You gotta visualize this guy. And he, he walks into an upscale restaurant, he orders the most expensive salad on the menu and he eats it and after he's done, he takes out a six gun and he shoots it in the air and starts to leave. And the, the restaurant owner says, what, what, what do you think you're doing? You can't get away with that kind of thing. And the guy says, do you have a, a uh, iPhone on you? And the restaurant owner pulls out his iPhone. He says, Siri, give me the definition of a panda. A panda is a cute furry animal that eats, shoots, and leaves. I think I heard that from originally from George. <laughs> so then we, we would occasionally get into theological jokes. And I told George this one, and he couldn't stop laughing for a while after 
this one. The, um, the rabbi of Jerusalem is standing in front of the Holy of Holies davening. Anybody ever see davening? Okay, it's, it's a very useful thing. If you, even if you're not Jewish, you can, you can daven. Um, so he's standing in front of the Holy of Holies, and he says, um, he has a blinding insight of God. And he goes, Yahweh, Elohim, you are everything, and I am nothing. He's davening away. The second rabbi in command comes in, and he goes, oh. He sees the spectacle of piety in front of him, and he goes, Yahweh, Elohim, you are everything, and I am nothing. You are everything, and I am nothing. The janitor in the synagogue comes in with his mop and pail. He puts down the mop and pail, overcome by the spectacle of piety in front of him. And he goes, Yahweh, Elohim, you are everything, and I am nothing. The first rabbi elbows the second rabbi and goes, so look who thinks he's nothing. Sarah reminded me of this today. <laughs> Several years ago, I had often heard about the, uh, the camp on, uh, uh, in Wayne, Maine, the legendary Wayne, Maine. And uh, finally, w one year I was at camp and George and Lois invited me to come with them. They were going to go up for the day and visit Sarah and and Andrew and family. I said, great, y'all go. So we were going to leave in a couple of days. The next day I had a cold, and I thought, hmm, I should probably say I can't go, but I really want to see this place in Wayne, Maine. And uh, so it was outing day. So outing day came, and they were going to, they said, come on, we're going to Wayne, Maine. I said, okay. So I sat in the back seat and blew my nose and, uh, I couldn't believe all the twists and turns we took to get there and how long it took to get there. Um, and, and so we got there and I had a wonderful day. It, uh, Sarah had made, I think, blueberry pie. I think I ate half of it. And um, went down uh, to the beach and a, another friend was there or a neighbor and I went out with him on a boat that had a little electric motor, little canoe ride or boat ride. And uh, the kids were there, they were running around. And, and, um, and Sarah said to me, when I, came, I think I went up in the porch and I was like really tired. I took medication for the cold and I was kind of nodding out. And she said, oh, by the way, um, don't be shocked if you see George out on the beach uh, naked. <laughs> and I was nonplussed, but I, you know, I feigned a plum, and but I was thinking, he, he, he's naked? George? I thought, well, you know, this is uh, rural Maine, and they have ways they do things every year. <laughs> and and well, who am I? The question is part of it. So, okay, I'm not offended by Newt P. You can all take your clothes off. I don't care. Um, but I just thought it was odd. <laughs> thought it was odd. Uh, but kind of cool, too. And, uh, and then later, uh, Sarah reminded me, I don't remember how sh we realized that I didn't understand which George she was talking about. <laughs> but, but we got it straightened out. Thank you. 
that's why it works. Right? <laughs> that, that's why I'm here to tell this story. We, we have a photo in the archives of Uncle George sitting on the front porch doing crossword puzzles. And uh, he, he and my mother had this thing, they would never look up the answers. My, they both did crossword puzzles every day. My mother would do a crossword puzzle and if she didn't know the answer, she'd put a little arrow in the margin next to it, pointing to it. And so some of the, and she wouldn't rip the page out of the book until there were no arrows, so all the arrows were crossed out. And the arrow meant she had to ask Uncle George the answer. <laughs> Right, and if he didn't know the answer, that stayed in that book forever, forever. <laughs> we cleaned out their house, we found this pile of crossword puzzle books with like six pages in this one and eight in that one with little arrows in the margin all the way along. <laughs> so <laughs> those are the ones neither of them knew the answer, so they'll never know the answers to those <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, wh while I'm up here, I'd like to tell two of my favorite Uncle Georgisms, uh, one, one serious and, and one funny. Uh, the, the, the serious one is, in one of his lectures here, he was talking about something and someone asked him about heaven and you know, it's your reward. And he said, heaven is not a reward for being good. Heaven is how it feels to be good. And that's just stuck with me the whole time. I've never lost that and it's just wonderful. The, the, the other one is one of, my, one, one of my nephews wears a shirt that says, you can either agree with me or you can be wrong. And George walks up to him and sees it for, for the first time and goes, I think I just did both. My name is Joe Tucker and uh, I'm married to Amy Reichardt, and when we got married, uh, George was the officiant for our wedding at the uh, Swedenborg Chapel in Cambridge. And um, in the months, maybe it was the previous fall, I think, uh, before the wedding, we were going to get together and, uh, and visit with George to, to have a you know, serious talk and kind of you know, go over our plans and our values and our commitment to each other and things like that and talk seriously about getting married and what it meant. And so he invited us up to Wayne uh, on Lake Androscoggin. And so we, we drove up to, to Wayne and uh, kind of like anticipating and kind of wondering like, okay, what is this going to be like? And uh, so we were up there and Amy, help me out. Was this when Freedom on Horn was there? Was that the same time? That might have been a different time. That might have been a different time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so we're up there, and we're both kind of wondering, like, so when is he going to, like, like, talk to us and ask us questions? <laughs> and, like, nothing's really happening, you know? And then uh, at some point in the day, uh, I think he says, um, you know, two of you should go out on the kayak and... Uh, or it's a canoe or a kayak, go out for a ride on the lake, you know? You know, it's really beautiful this time of year. So I'm like, oh, okay. So we go out <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> we're out on the lake and we've never like rowed together or any of that kind of stuff. And so we're trying to like work through some issues of like, you know, how to do it the right way. And kind of like, no, you, you know, we've got to work it out. And so we have this like long ride. It was very nice, but it was a little challenging. And then we kind of get back, and both of us kind of had this feeling that like George was kind of looking at us like, kind of like the cat who ate the canaries kind of thing, you know? Like he had this way of getting us to sort of like, uh, kind of come to terms with each other in a, in, a, in a challenging way. And then later on we talked, but it was very casual and it was nothing like the sort of intense thing we imagined. So there's that story. Um, and then the other thing that really struck me later although it's a small thing, but like little details can sort of have meaning, uh, was when we were actually the, getting married and we were, uh, you know, at Swedenborg Chapel standing there and going through the course of service and all the things that happen with music and different things. And then George gave a little talk. And while he was giving the talk to us, there was one part where he spoke about 
that sometimes you really come to appreciate and love the person deeply when you're apart from them. And we both, I think, saw him get a little, like, a little teary-eyed. And it was, like, super powerful because, um, you know, like, after this, I think after it was over, we were, like, maybe we were riding to the reception and we were both, like, looking, turning to each other and we were like, did he get emotional up there? <laughs> and it was, like, it was kind of, it was sort of, um, it kind of gave you this feeling, like, uh, of such deep authenticity. Uh, and we were really grateful, uh, you know, to have to have him uh, kind of in our lives in, in that way as a, sort of a as a teacher and, and mentor, and uh, and that that moment, like, you know, here's somebody who's officiating at your wedding, who's, you know, they're really doing it real. They're not. There's nothing. There's nothing um, rote about it. You know, it's 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 truly genuine, and and that was George. I don't, I don't think this is really a funny story, but um, we've talked a bit today about that, what Gar just um, shared about what, what gives an idea authority and it's whether it's useful in your life. Um, and I think that's something that George taught me and it came early on in our relationship. I had um, just discovered Swedenborg through Andrew and I would um, leave Divinity School and come down to Sharon and stay up in the attic and read through the books up there and I'd read A Scientist Explores Spirit and I'd read Sorting Things Out and I was burning through stuff fast, I mean so fast that I ended up reading the compendium one night and that is just like 700 pages of just straight up Swedenborg, right? And um, I'm, I'm just, you know, going along, going along, just loving all of this and I get to Earths in the Universe and I have this moment of crisis. <laughs> I, I was really digging everything until like we were talking about people on Venus and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, and so I went down the stairs and then down the stairs and down the stairs because I'm up in the attic and he's watching sports in the living room and I sit down on the couch next to him and I'm trying to think, how do I ask him about this? And I just said, George. He said, yeah? I said, Earth's in the universe. And he doesn't even look at me. He just said, doesn't change the way I treat Lois. <laughs> And so I, yeah, I know. And so I took the book and I, I, I went back upstairs and I, and I thought about that for a long time. And I just thought, all right, yeah, if it's not useful, it's not useful. Let it go. But you know, cling to what's useful. Does it make you a more loving person or not? So I, I skipped over the rest of Earth in the Universe and I just kept, I just kept moving on. I think went to the New Jerusalem after that. But it actually really gave me something to orient myself toward. And I love that um, expression today, you know, he would say, I, I need to ask George, and you know, you need to ask your own heart, you know, is this gonna help me be a better person? I think that's something George did for all of us. This story is called Yes, George. Um, over the years that I was growing up, uh, George and I are almost exactly 10 years apart. So I turned 80 this year, and he was within 10 days, I think, of turning 90. Is that true? Um, and uh, so I, I figured I had it made when I would go for a run with him. We, we would get up at six o'clock in the morning, and I was in pretty good shape. I was a wrestler in college, like uh, Louis Dole was, and uh, I've rock climbed and ran and did all these kinds of uh, physical things. And George and I would kind of vie for running, and we would have these amazing, interesting, philosophical conversations as we would run. And I would always prepare a whole inventory of things to say 
But as we toiled up, it was about six in the morning, uh, during, we ran every day that the assembly was open or I was there and George was there. We would toil up the hill, uh, uh, Stark's Hill and back there. And I would have all this, I, I'd been reading Kierkegaard and Martin Heidegger and all this kind of stuff. And I had all this stuff prepared to say, but as we toiled up the hill, all I could say was, yes, George, yes, George, yes, George. I'll just do one more song and we'll say good night if that works for everybody. Oh, oh, perfect, wonderful. Um. Mm. Gotta find the key. So George is so much to so many of us, and one thing he was to everybody I saw him with was a friend, and uh, this is reportedly the last song Pete Seeger wrote is called Wonderful Friends. And I'm going to see if I can find the right key for it. And it's got a little bit of a chorus you could probably find. Oh, I haven't found the right key yet. When I think of the ways that I've grown, I know I couldn't have made it alone. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. That's the chorus. It'll come back around, even when by guitar out of tune. Here we are, all in one place, all gathered together. We've helped each other down this road, whatever the weather. We have no need for pots of gold, for friends are a treasure. So hold hands, sing it again. When I think of the ways that I've grown, I know I couldn't have made it alone. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. Many years ago when I was feeling discouraged I found that singing with my friends would fill me with courage It's a rough and rocky road we're on but when we get worried With old friends, we'll sing it again When I think of the ways that I've grown I know I couldn't have made it alone I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. It looks like we might sing all night, but looks are deceiving. That old clock up upon the wall says soon we'll be leaving. Though we go our separate ways, there's no need for grieving. So hold hands and sing it again if you want to. When I think of the ways that I've grown, I know I couldn't have made it alone. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. I owe a lot to the sharing, caring, daring, wonderful friends that I've known. How helpless we are as isolated individuals. How much we need others and how much we ourselves are needed. We have days when we 
I terribly long long for company. We have other days when we're peopled out and desperately need some quiet time alone. Both of these are healthy, part of the growing process. And others too may need to get away from us or may need, may need us to draw closer and help us to be sensitive to those needs both in ourselves and in, in, in others. The community comes one day at a time, sometimes one moment at a time, and the moment is always now. Amen. 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 Amen.